You know, we're in the middle of a series at the moment called What Do You See? And that is a fascinating question because it can be interpreted in so many different ways, in so many different contexts. And if I was to ask each one of you that question this morning, I would probably get as many different answers as there are people watching this right now. I mean, sure, at first you would probably say, well, Tim, right now I can see your face on my TV screen. And if I look to my left and to my right, I can see the same four walls and surroundings and faces that I've seen for the last however many weeks, however many it feels like at this moment in time. But then if you think a little bit beyond that, it would be, what do you see in your world around you? Because what we see physically probably hasn't changed a great deal in the last few months. You know, it's, it's kind of that our surroundings are, are what they are right here and now. But actually the way that we see it can change drastically. And the way that we see things can be massively variable. You know, there are many different ways of seeing things. You can see physically, you can see emotionally, you can see intellectually, you can see positively, you can see negatively, you can see everything in between. But often the way that we see our world and the way that we see the people around us, the way that we see our circumstances and our situations can vary a great deal depending on the attitude that we choose to look with and the way that we choose to see. And this morning, I'd like to suggest a new way of seeing, a new way of choosing to look. And in answer to that question of what do you see, I want to offer a slightly different approach to the way that you see your world. And we find it in a book in the Bible. It's quite a small book. It's a little bit obscure. Some of you may be aware of it. Some of you may not. If you haven't, please do have a look at it. It's well worth a go. It's a tiny little book called the book of Habakkuk. The book of Habakkuk was written by a guy or certainly about a guy called Habakkuk. And Habakkuk essentially was in a situation around about 700 years before Jesus was born. He was writing this this book and essentially what he was doing was he was having a rant at God. It's a very small book and the first chapter pretty much exclusively is him complaining and ranting and having a go. He is not happy. He is having a proper pop. He is really letting rip at God because essentially he is not happy with the way that the world is at that moment in time. And Israel was in a really bizarre situation at that moment in time because it was between, caught in a power struggle between two superpowers. You've got the Assyrians on one side, you've got the Babylonians on the other, and Israel caught right smack in the middle. And in the midst of slavery and oppression and death and everything that goes along with that situation, Habakkuk is not happy with the way that the world is. And how he expresses that is he has a rant of God. And you might be able to kind of appreciate or relate to that attitude and that feeling and that situation at the moment. You know, you may not be subject to oppression and slavery and death, but you might not be happy with the way that the world is at this moment in time. And one of the greatest things about this chapter, chapter one, right? We're not going to read chapter one, but it's well worth a look because even Habakkuk describes it as a complaint or a series of complaints. Chapter one is reassuring because if nothing else, it gives us validation that it is okay to have a rant at God on occasion. It is okay to not be happy with the way that the world is. It is okay to not be happy with what is going on. It is okay to be frustrated. It is okay to have challenges in the way that you think about what is going on and to essentially say to God, you know what, God, where are you? You know, what is going on at this moment in time? Habakkuk sums it up in chapter one, verse two. He says, how long, Lord, must I call for help and you do not listen? It is okay to have those thoughts and those feelings and those frustrations. And do you know what? Maybe it's a little bit of reassurance and it's how I interpret it, but God is big enough to take it. If you're frustrated at the way that life is, if you're frustrated with what's going on at the moment, it's okay. You can have a run and you can have a pop. But there is a challenge that goes along with it because having had that and having had that moment of complaining to God and essentially saying, why are you not turning up and doing what you're supposed to be doing? Why are you not turning up and fixing this for me? Why are you not turning up and being faithful to your people, apparently? Why are you not turning up and dealing with the things that you said in your word that you would deal with? Habakkuk does something fascinating. He has his pop. He has his rant. He says his piece. 
He complains to God and then he does something really interesting at the, at the start of chapter two that really asks us the question of what do you see in this situation right here and now? Chapter two, verse one. Habakkuk says this, I will stand at my watch and station myself upon the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint. In other words, Habakkuk has his go, he has his rant, he has his pop, he's not happy about the situation, he goes to God, he makes no bones about that, he says, God, I am not happy about this situation, why are you not dealing with this, where are you, why am I crying out to you and you're not responding, why am I not getting any help here? But then, he stops, and he waits for God to have his say. You know, so often we're good at the first bit. I know I'm good at the first bit. I can rant and I can have a go and I can do whatever I need to do. I can, I can be unhappy with God and I can be unhappy with the world in general. A lot of the time I don't even rant to God. I'll rant to my wife or rant to people that I know. And they, they're probably as sick of it as God is. But I, how often do I actually stop and think and listen to what God wants to say in response to my complaint? And sometimes I wonder whether that is the missing part that we're missing out on. You know, I will, I will stand my, station myself on my watchtower. I will station myself on the, ramp, on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me. This morning, can I encourage you, whatever situation you're in, whatever your frustrations are, whatever difficulty you're in, look to see what he will say to you. You know, honestly, I think we can be honest with God, we can be unrestrained, we can be, choose not to be fake, we can be truthful about how we're feeling, but we need to look to see what he will say to us so that he has the opportunity to show us. And, you know, that can be a little bit of a, a dangerous prayer, but it's a prayer that is well worth praying. Do you know what, God, in this situation, what are you doing? You know, where, where are you? Show me what you are doing, because God is doing something. You know, everything that is going on, God is working. God is doing something. He may not appear to be to you. He may not be obvious to you in what he's doing, but he's doing something. He is working. He's working in your life. He's working in the people around you. He's working in every situation in society, because that is who God is. So ask the question, God, what are you doing? here and now. When life is difficult, in this season, in this moment, right here and now, what are you doing? Let me see what you are doing. Let me see how you are working. You know, the Bible encourages us to be inquisitive. It encourages us to ask questions. It encourages us to ask things of God. There's some really famous verses, and we're going to touch on one or two of them. Matthew 7, 7 to 8 says this, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, the door will be opened. It's a promise. If you ask, you will receive. If you seek, you will find. If you knock, the door will be opened to you. So what are you asking for this morning? What are you seeking this morning? What do you see this morning? Jeremiah 29, verse 12 to 14, it's just, it's a passage just after that really famous verse that people put on Instagram and Facebook um, backgrounds with some sort of forest or a lake or some sort of imagery behind them. Um, and it is, for I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord, the plans for a, for a hope and a future that you'll prosper, right? It's after that. That's, that's Jeremiah 29, 11. Right? Jeremiah 29, 12 says this, then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. Do you know what? If you seek me and you seek me with all of your heart, I will be found by you and I will come to you and I will rescue you and I will save you. Promises of God 
in the Bible? Are you seeking him in this season where it's frustrating, where it's difficult? Are you seeking him? Because if you seek him with all of your heart, he will be found by you. God is amazing in the way that he is faithful to his word. He will do what he has said he will do. Whether it seems unlikely or not, if you seek him with all of your heart, he will be found by you. God wants you to seek him. God wants you to ask him. God wants you to see what he is doing. You know, I don't know what your experience of lockdown has been like. Uh, for me, I've been working from home and I've been working from home with initially four children off school. And um, because when the schools closed, all of my children, I've got four children, all of them obviously came home and we were homeschooling them while trying to work. And for me, work has essentially consisted of sitting at my desk and in my office at home and trying to conduct Microsoft Teams meetings or video meetings. Um, and I've been doing that while having four children at home. Then when the schools reopened, I had two of my children go back to school and two of my children still stayed at home. And so um, I had to start pretty much every meeting. And I've got into this routine now. It's, it's quite standard for me. And in fact, it needs to go, goes without saying for a lot of people that I work with now. Um, but I went through a phase of starting every meeting with the standard apology that I will be interrupted at some point by a small child wandering into the room and shooting me with a Nerf gun or coming in crying because they couldn't find the particular sword that a Lego figure needed um, or there was some sort of argument about which hat that the Lego Ninjago figure should be wearing. If you're not aware of Lego Ninjago, um, that's probably a good thing. Um, but, <laughs> but Or they would come in and have some sort of crisis, some complete meltdown, or they just wanna come in and, and give me a picture or give me a hug or pull funny faces behind me in my most serious meetings. And, I would like to say that I always handled every single one of those situations with the utmost grace and, and love and affirmation for my children. But I think we all know that that's not necessarily the case. I got things right sometimes. I got things wrong sometimes. Um, and I think I've learned quite a lot in the process. But essentially, one of the things that I've had to learn is to be interruptible. And that while I'm working and I've got children at home and it's not their fault that I've got to work and it's not their fault that school is closed and it's all very difficult. And But while I'm doing that, I need to be interruptible for my children. And like I say, sometimes I get it right, sometimes I get it wrong, but I'm learning. And one of the things that I'm learning is that when you ask God, do you know what, God, in this situation, what are you doing? He answers when you ask him a question, it says, ask and you will receive, right? You ask him a question, he will answer you. It's not always in the way that you would like. Um, but if you ask God a question, he will answer. And so if you ask him, God, in this season, in this moment, what are you doing? I believe right here and now in this season for me, God is trying to teach me something about the heart of the Father and of about how to approach the throne of grace, how to approach the Father, how to come before him. And one of the beautiful things about God is that he is interruptible for us. He is available for us. He's willing to see us. He's willing to speak to us. He's willing to give everything. In fact, it's more than that. He is eager to bless us. He is eager to demonstrate his love. And above that, he is passionate about me. He is passionate about you. He is passionate about each one of us and passionate about demonstrating his love for us. And that is why I'm so grateful that God is so much better at being interrupted than I am. But I'm learning something about the Father heart of God in being interruptible, in being available, in being willing, in being eager and in being passionate about the people that God has blessed me with in my life. And this is the really encouraging thing is that we can approach the Father. You know, Hebrews 4.16 says this, it says, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We can approach the throne of grace. We can approach the Father. We can approach the throne of grace, which is what we do not deserve, giving to us what we do not deserve. It doesn't matter what has been going on. It doesn't matter how difficult we're finding things. It doesn't matter how frustrated we are. We can approach 
the Father. We can approach the throne of grace. He is interruptible, available, willing, eager and passionate to see us. 1 John 5, 14, 15 says this. It says, this is the confidence we have in approaching God. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. We can have the confidence in approaching God that when we ask him, he hears us. And when he hears us, that we have confidence that he will give to us what we need in this season, in this moment, right here and now. We can interrupt the Father and we can approach God's throne. And do you know what? This is a word from God for you this morning. That God loves you. He knows your situation. He loves you. He knows everything that you are dealing with and everything that is going on in your life right now. Good and bad, happy and sad, joyful and grieving. He knows and he loves you. He is available. He is there. He has time for you. He will make time for you. He will create space for you. He is willing and eager and passionate to see you and to demonstrate his love for you. So take your worries, your concerns, your frustrations, your difficulties, everything, and lay them before him because he loves you. Look to see what he would say to you this morning. And so we're called to approach, you know, we're called to love God. We're called to focus on our relationship with him. And for some of us, that's where we need to focus right now. For some of us, we need to focus on our relationship. We need to find that time with God again. We need to find that moment of being loved and accepted for who we are with him and knowing his peace. But there's also another step to this because we are meant to love God and he loves us. But we are also meant to love others. You know, if we skip back in ch a chapter in 1 John, right? 1 John 4, we've just looked at 1 John 5, we've got 1 John 4. 1 John 4, 19 to 21 says this, we, we love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or sister, is a liar. Ouch. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen, cannot love God who they haven't seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. For brother and sister, insert name here, right? Insert whoever you have in your sphere of influence, whoever God has placed in your life. If you love God, you need to love them too. We love because he first loved us. You know, God loves us so high, so deep, so wide, so vast, so all-encompassing, and yet he loved us so that we can love other people. We love because he first loved us. So this message is about lifting ourselves, but it's also about lifting others. It's about lifting others around us. You know, we need to cultivate a heart that loves those around us, even when it is difficult and they are difficult to love. We need to cultivate a heart with the right attitude that loves those around us and lifts them up. So I want to suggest a range of options that are available to us that we can choose from, a range of attitudes that we can have that will enable us to love those around us. And the good news about this is that this is a scale, right? You can be anywhere on this scale, it is okay. And if you are anywhere on this scale, it's all good because you are still going to be able to demonstrate love to people. But there are ways and means of demonstrating God's love for people more and more and more and more. So wherever you are on the scale, on whatever particular day it is, because do you know what? God knows that we have bad days. God knows that we have days when we struggle. God knows when you have, that you have days where all of your capacity is just on keeping things together for yourself. That it's okay. You know, remember what we're approaching. We are approaching the throne of grace. It's okay. But we can choose to challenge ourselves, whatever stage we are at, to move on. And so these are the five attitudes 
very quickly, rapid fire, five attitudes that you can choose to have that will allow you to lift those around you, to love those around you. So first one, be interruptible. You know, if nothing else, be interruptible. If we're not careful, we can get so absorbed in our own world, in, in the things that are going on around us, in everything that we are so focused on doing, in our work, in our home, in our, in our difficulties, in, our, in the great things that are going on, we can get so absorbed in our own world that we forget to be interruptible for those who need us. Be interruptible. If nothing else, when you are going about your daily life, everything that you're doing, be willing to be interrupted. Be willing for somebody to come in and say, actually, do you know what? I, I'm really struggling here. Be interruptible. You know, Jesus spent most of his life being interrupted by people. If you look back through the Gospels, even if you just look at the Gospel of Matthew, right, and look at all of the miracles that Jesus did, there are so many of them where Jesus was on his way somewhere else and he was interrupted. You know, Zacchaeus, he was on his way somewhere else and Zacchaeus was up in a tree and he was in, his journey was interrupted. When you, you've got the, the woman who was healed from, from bleeding, he was literally on his way to heal somebody else and she interrupted him and he healed her. He crossed over the river to have some, sorry, over the Lake of Galilee to have some solitude and some time to himself. And people followed him and they interrupted his time of solitude, his time when he wanted time to himself. They interrupted him and it says that he had compassion on them. Jesus was interruptible. Let's be interruptible for those around us. So that's the first one. Second one, be available. You can be interruptible, but are you available? You know, sometimes this is about creating space. It's about creating some margin to be able to help those around us. It's about creating some time in your day where you choose to actively um, make a difference in somebody else's life. You know, if we're not careful, we can get so consumed by the schedule, by the busyness, that life just becomes full. You know, somebody can interrupt us if we want, but people don't really feel that they can interrupt us because we're so busy that if we create some margin and we create some space, to be available for people, then we can actually have an impact on them. You know, make some time for your kids. Make some time for your relationships. Make some time for your family. Make some time for people that you know. Make some time for your neighbours. And it will pay off in spades as time goes on. Be interruptible. Be available. Next one, be willing, right? Because you can be interruptible. You can be available but are you willing to do something? Are you willing to go out of your way? Are you willing to take something that's potentially an inconvenience to you to lift somebody else, to help somebody else, to love somebody else? Am I willing to be inconvenienced? Am I willing to put my own agenda aside? You know, Jesus in the feeding of the 5,000, he landed, this is the story that I was talking about earlier. He went away privately to a solitary place and five thousand people followed him now i get frustrated when i get one or two children walk into the room when i'm trying to work five thousand people when you're trying to have some alone time can you imagine but jesus was available and willing to help them willing not just to satisfy their desire for him and to preach to them and speak to them and, and share his wisdom and, of who god was but actually his desire to provide for them materially to provide a miracle for them so that they would not go hungry in that moment in time? Are you willing to provide some time and resource for those around you? So be interruptible, be available, be willing. Next one, be eager, right? And this is really stepping it up a little bit. You know, do you wait for people to come to you? Do I wait for people to come to me before I choose to demonstrate love to them, before I choose to bless them? Do I wait for a crisis? Or am I eager to help others? Am I actively seeking out other people to help and to love and to bless? Am I eager to love? Am I eager to show kindness to those around me? Uh, eager people are the proactive people. They are the ones who go out of their way to demonstrate love to other people. And you know people like this and you like people like this. You like those people being in your life because they make, they go out of their way to show their love for you. They go out of their way to bless you. They, these are the people who drop things off on your doorstep, who choose that moment when they don't know whether you're struggling or whether you're having a good day or what, but they're just dropping something because they just want to love you. They just want to bless you. They just want to give you something. They're eager 
for that. And you like these people. We need to choose to be eager to love people and to help people. You know, Acts 28, the Apostle Paul has a shipwreck and he's washed up on the island of Malta. He's on his way to Rome. He gets shipwrecked. He washes up on the island of Malta in the Mediterranean. And it talks about the people on the island. And it says this, Ephesians 28, verse 2, the islanders showed us unusual kindness. They built a fire and welcomed us all because it was raining and cold. Unusual kindness. They went out of their way to demonstrate love to people who could not repay them back, who couldn't give them anything in return. They had no self-interest. They were eager to demonstrate love to these people. So be interruptible, be available, be willing, be eager and be passionate. Right? You can be passionate about lifting other people. These are the people who truly go above and beyond. They give their everything. It's not, it's a part of who they are. That actually loving other people, lifting other people, encouraging other people, this become part of their DNA. It's become part of how they choose to live their life. It has become part of what they do. And again, you know some of these people and you love some of these people. It is great to have a passionate, a person who is passionate for lifting others in your life because they will lift you like you would not believe. And it's amazing to have these people in your life. They are not perfect people because we know that perfect people are a little bit like unicorns in that they don't really exist. But perfect people don't exist. But passionate people do. People who are passionate about lifting others, about helping others. And they will have good days and they will have bad days and they'll have days when they don't feel like it. But they will have days where they know that they are passionate about reaching other people. It is possible to be passionate about lifting those around us. How? Because what is impossible with man is possible with God. You know, we can approach the throne of grace confidently, knowing that we may have a bad day, but God can pick up the slack. Knowing that God will be there for us in the difficult times as well as in the good times, when we feel like it, when we don't. And remember that this is a scale. You can be anywhere on this scale. You can be interruptible. Brilliant. You're interruptible. You can be available. Brilliant. You're available. You can be willing. Excellent. You're willing. You can be eager. Brilliant. You are eager. You can be passionate. Amazing. Be passionate about lifting people around you. And if we continue our skipping back in 1 John, right? 1 John 4, going back a few verses. 1 John 4, 7 to 12 shows us how we do this, shows us why we do this. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to count how many times the word love appears in this passage of six verses, right? Check this out. 1 John 4, 7 to 12. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent us his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, Since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Thirteen times love appears in that passage. Six verses, thirteen loves. Do you know what? That is the context for lifting those around us, for loving those around us, because God first loved us. And this is my prayer for you this morning, right? That in this season, in this situation, this circumstance, whatever is going on in your life, good, bad, ugly, everything in between, right? That you would know love, 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 that you would know God's love for you, that you would know that he has loved you and you can love those around you, that you can love 
other people. That we would love one another. That we would know God because God is love. That we would know his son who sacrificed himself to remove any barriers between us and receiving that love. And that since God so loved us that we would love one another. Because if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Have a great week. Be interruptible, be available, be willing, be eager, be passionate and be loved.